I talk about horror games a lot on this channel, but like a lot of people out there, my first true gaming love was 3D platformers. Growing up on the PS1 meant I spent most of my childhood playing games like Crash and Spyro, and then moved on to the PS2 with Jack and Daxter, Ratchet and Clank, and many other classics. There was a time when the 3D platformer was king, and it felt like every second game was trying to be the next Crash Bandicoot or Banjo-Kazooie. While there have been a few very high profile attempts at the genre in the indie scene, it doesn't have the same widespread reach as say, NES or SNES inspired games. So today I thought I would highlight some 3D platformers that I found on my most recent Itch.io deep dive. Some are very traditional collectathons, some are inspired by specific classics, and others are a little on the strange side. Nitro is an upcoming 3D collectathon inspired by the classic Spyro trilogy. You play as Nitro, a robot cat who explores unique worlds collecting colourful bolts and golden gears. In the current demo, there's only two areas, the hub world and a level called the Scrapyard. If you've played the classic Spyro games before this, then this'll all be very familiar to you. Nitro can glide over large gaps, ram into hard objects, and spit electricity to deal with enemies. Their flying companion allows them to collect bolts from a distance, and also acts as your life bar, just like Sparks. At its core, Nitro is a Spyro fan game, so there are some clear similarities. To be completely fair to it, I'll try to talk about Spyro as little as possible. Firstly, the game looks and controls very well. The hub world has a few different paths for you to explore, and a lot of verticality that allows you to really stretch your gliding ability. The RAM also controls quite well, allowing you to keep a decent speed once you know where you're going. While the hub world is mostly empty aside from collectibles for now, the scrapyard is a different story. This level is themed after an old graveyard, with robotic skeletons and metal jack-o'-lanterns. It definitely feels more like a fourth or fifth level rather than a tutorial stage, because there's a lot going on here. Some of the secret collectibles require you to fly around corners and over massive drops, some enemies counter your electric attacks, and the platforming is particularly difficult. I don't know if this is because the demo is a little bit older, or if the game is just going to be hard, but some of these gliding sections require you to make some very specific jumps. Once you get the hang of it though, the scrapyard has tons of room for exploration, and rewards you for getting up high and really surveying the level. One comparison I will allow myself is the music, because the two tracks in the demo are both incredible. The hub world track sounds like it could have come from a Spyro OST, but the real winner is the Scrapyard theme, which sounds a lot closer to a Ratchet and Clank track. They really help to capture the vibe the game is going for. All in all, the demo is quite short, but there's a lot going on in it. Like any good 3D platformer, it feels good to control, the collectibles have a good shine and sound effect to them, and it's not a walk in the park. One thing I love in an indie game is fast pick up and play levels so that you get right into the action and have some fun. And that's exactly what Tori 3D is. This 3D runner is all about two things, collecting stars and going fast. In this game you play as a little chick named Tori. He's got sunglasses, a backpack, and his ice cream has been stolen by a creepy angel. In order to get it back, you have to dash your way through eight different levels, collecting as many stars as possible along the way. There's a lot of inspiration going on here, but think of it kind of like a 3D Sonic game without any of his spin dashes or combat. Tori can run and double jump, and while that might seem a bit restrictive, each level introduces a different gimmick to help increase the speed. You've got moving platforms, turbo fans, speed boost platforms, icy slopes, and a couple other unique challenges. There are four basic level types, and each one gets two versions with varying difficulty. Your first time through, you don't have to rush through and get the best time possible. Instead, you're encouraged to explore and collect all of the stars. Once you reach the ninth level and beat the game, you can go back and really start aiming for those S ranks. Sprinting through the levels in Tori encourages you to find and use every shortcut you can, cut corners, float over gaps, and use your jumps wisely. The game also just looks really good. It was created by Siactro, who has a lot of experience making 3D platformers, and in fact, there are a number of Tori games on his itch page that I encourage you to look at. I probably could have filled this list entirely with their games. My favourite thing about the game though is the music and sound design. Tori's sound effects are adorable as he slides and bounces his way through the level picking up stars, and just listen to some of these level tracks.
Tori is an incredibly fun and fast-paced platformer that will have you trying to beat your high score again and again. I couldn't go an entire video without getting some horror content in there. Plead with the Mountain God is a 3D platformer with a simple goal. Climb to the top of the tower and tell the Mountain God your wish. In this case, our protagonist has lost their loved one and is desperate to get her back. Along the way, he runs into multiple people who all attempted the climb at one point, and either couldn't go any further, or returned after deciding the perilous journey wasn't worth it. Eventually, the people of the area decided to close the gate to the tower in order to discourage people from attempting it. This doesn't deter our protagonist, and instead leads him towards more obscure paths and dangerous jumps. As you climb higher and higher, you'll start to see red glowing items scattered throughout the area, only to finally reach one and discover that they're hearts, apparently formed from the distilled essence of people who've attempted the climb before you. There are 30 of them in total, and you're encouraged to find as many as you can before reaching the summit. Eventually, you'll find yourself at an impasse, unable to go any further, with only a pool of blood at the end of the path. Praying at the fountain grants you a new ability that allows you to continue your journey, but the protagonist's body is forever changed by this power. That's your basic loop. Climb, search for hearts, find a new upgrade, and repeat. The platforming itself is relatively easy, and only gets easier the more upgrades you find. The one thing I wish the game had was some indication underneath of where the character is landing, but once you learn the arc and speed of the jump, it becomes a lot easier to tell. The aesthetic of the game is very gloomy, and honestly kind of reminds me of the original Drakengard a little. I don't know if it's just the protagonist's hair, but he gives me Kaim vibes in the beginning. Of course, as your character becomes more blessed by the Mountain God, he starts to change physically eventually becoming more demonic than human. I won't say much more, as the game is relatively short. If you're gonna play this one, you should know that you only need 20 hearts to unlock the second ending, which is only two-thirds of the total. Plead with the Mountain God is a moody, Lovecraftian story with some fun puzzle platforming. Mallory and the Marble Sanctum is probably the weirdest game on this list. This is the demo for a full game simply titled Mallory, a story-driven adventure game about exploring an endless labyrinth. The game begins with Mallory waking up in a bed, floating in a black void. After realizing that this wasn't her bed or her bedroom, the bed falls, eventually landing on a strange blocky platform. With no hints on where to go, Mallory decides it would be best to look around and see what she can find. The place Mallory finds herself in is full of marble blocks and bizarre architecture, often ending in pitfalls whenever the ground isn't rising up to meet her footsteps. She doesn't know exactly what she's looking for, but what she does know is that there's a strange shrine with three pillars and three paths for her to investigate. So she wanders around, jumping across platforms, standing on moving blocks, hoping to jump and climb her way to some explanation. While I did first describe this as an adventure game, there's enough platforming in it that I'm comfortable describing it as a puzzle platformer. Also, it's just such a cool looking game that I had to include it. The scratchy filter over everything, the way the black and white environments make the world feel gigantic, and the occasional red light that creeps through. It looks incredible. Mallory herself also has such a cute design, and her dialogue is very entertaining. At first, I was afraid the writing would be a bit too try-hard, but I actually found a lot of Mallory's thoughts and observations to be quite funny, like when she wonders what would be at the top of a seemingly infinite chain of moving blocks, only to come to the conclusion that it's probably just more blocks. As she continues her journey, Mallory finds pages that seem to be from a fiction book. However, more importantly, they seem to include messages written to her from some unknown person. Adding to that is the glimpses of another person that she sees in the distance wandering the same landscape as her, and Mallory begins to suspect that this isn't an ordinary dream. The mystery is very complex, and don't expect to get many answers from this demo alone. There are other memories sprinkled throughout the world, fragments of conversations that Mallory doesn't recognize, which further cause into question exactly what this world is. After some more puzzle solving and a run-in with a dangerous force, Mallory finally makes it back to the shrine, and wakes up. Now, back in her normal world, we see Mallory's home, a cardboard box that she shares with her roommate, Kat. Kat explains that she had been tossing and turning in her sleep, and asks if she had the same nightmare again. While Kat regularly leaves the confines of their house, it seems that Mallory is normally reluctant to do the same, instead staying inside where it's safe. 
We don't know a lot about the world Mallory inhabits, only that Cat refers to the cat-shaped clock on the wall as an offensive caricature of my species, crudely manufactured by my former oppressors, which implies that if humans existed in this world, they seem to be long gone by now. After some more discussions of her dreams and the world outside, Mallory decides her new purpose is to find the person she saw exploring the marble world in the real world, to tell them that they're not alone in their experience, and also to hopefully find out why this is happening to them. The demo ends with Cat warning Mallory of the dangers of the outside world, before she opens the door and steps out. I don't normally go this deep into story in these videos, however, I think Mallory deserves it. It's creepy and dark at points, yes, but it's also got a very lighthearted sense of humour to it. There's also a lot of details and gameplay moments that I've left out of my summary, so if you're in any way interested in it, I highly recommend giving it a look and seeing what else is in here. There's clearly a lot more going on than is apparent in the demo, and I'm not sure exactly what the full game will be like, but I'm very excited to see more. For the final game, we're looking at one more Spyro-inspired game titled Zera Myths Awaken. This one actually started out as a Spyro fan game called Spyro 4, but was eventually stripped of most of the Spyro branding and reinvented as its own game. Now starring an axolotl-bat hybrid named Zera, the game follows a pretty standard setup. A world is under threat from a mysterious bad guy, the protagonist visits different worlds and cultures in order to stop the invaders, with the hope of finding enough magical collectibles to stop the villain. In the demo, you can explore the hub world and four individual levels, each with their own unique design and enemies. I could sit here and tell you how the NPCs and worlds are very reminiscent of Spyro 2 and 3, or how the game nails the PS1 aesthetic, but instead, I want to talk about what makes Zera stand out. When I first booted the game up, I actually had a bit of trouble meshing with it, and that was due to two factors. I was trying to play the game like it was Spyro, and there wasn't any tutorial to tell me otherwise. This might sound like a strange thing to say about a game that started as a Spyro fan game, but while Zera's kit is very similar, similar to Spyro, you don't really play the game in the same way. In the early levels, I was ramming and gliding my way through the stages, missing jumps and finding areas that I felt I couldn't possibly reach without a power-up. Eventually, I discovered that Zera had a ball bounce ability that allows you to break certain objects and explore the levels a bit easier, so that opened things up a bit. But it wasn't until I bashed my head repeatedly off some very tough platforming sections in the third level that I realized what I was missing. In Spyro, the name of the game is using the entire arc of your jump to glide extra far, and then tap triangle to give yourself one last boost once you reach your destination. While this is an option in Zera, it won't get you near any of the real challenging platforms. That is, until you realize that you can do a triple jump by pressing right click, then space, then right click again. You can also choose not to do the third jump and just glide out of the second one to get major distance. Once I realized this, the game opened up and suddenly everything clicked into place. All of the areas I couldn't reach or barely managed to land on before were incredibly easy to access now that I had the basic movement down. I say basic movement because learning this is an absolute requirement for the later levels, never mind just getting some of the more obscure secrets. After realizing this, I started to have a blast with the game. It feels incredibly fun to play. Zera moves really fast and fluidly once you know what you're doing, and figuring out how to reach certain platforms is incredibly satisfying. But again, I I really wish there was some basic tutorial that informs you of this. It doesn't have to teach you the triple jump or some of the more complex moves, but even just an explanation of what your moves do would be incredibly helpful in the early game. One more thing, and this is less of a criticism and more of a personal preference, but the music didn't gel with me. It's very electronic and techno-y, and honestly I don't think it fits in certain locations. With those out of the way, I want to reiterate that I think this game is great. Once I hit a flow and started traversing the levels more efficiently, the game became exceptionally fun, and the levels are really well designed so far. The NPCs around the hub world all have fun, unique dialogue, and the demo includes some cool costumes for Zera, including a very recognizable onesie. It's very obvious that the game is inspired by Spyro, but I think it adds enough unique ideas to the gameplay to make it much more than that.
Thanks for watching. As always, all of the games I talked about today are linked in the description, and I'd highly recommend checking them out and showing them some support. If you're new here, then please consider subscribing. I do videos like this regularly, and if you have any recommendations, then you can let me know in the comments, or over on my Twitter. My socials are also in the description, alongside my coffee if you feel so inclined. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you real soon.